ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, Jeff Dunn's my name, and it's my privilege to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. And on behalf of the PCFA and ICON, Cancer Care, we do welcome you uh, to this webinar this afternoon uh, on focal brachiotherapy. Uh, to help me this afternoon, we have a, a star-spangled a, a star spangled panel of experts. Uh, we certainly have Dr. Andrew C. Uh, and Andrew is a radiation oncologist um, at ICON Cancer Centre. Um, uh, and of course, we also have uh, uh, Associate Professor Jeremy Grummet. And Jeremy is a urologist, also uh, based in Melbourne. In addition to that, we have PCFA's very own Director of Nursing, uh, Sally Sara, uh, who's also on the panel today to help us as we navigate issues surrounding focal bracket therapy and, and this new treatment, relatively new treatment for people diagnosed uh, and treated for prostate cancer. We have about 70 uh, people registered for the webinar. So to each and every one of you, thank you. It's terrific to have you here, um, wherever you are throughout Australia. And of course, to those of you who may be joining us from overseas, uh, everyone is welcome. And we do encourage you to participate. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen as we go through, there's a Q&A button down below. So if you do have any questions you'd like to submit to our panelists throughout the session, uh, please do type them in. Uh, and we'll take note of those and time permitting at the end, uh, depending how we travel today, we'll certainly address those. And if not, uh, we might ask our panelists anyway to, to actually record or, or, or note a response to those which we can add to the um, presentation which we place uh, on websites uh, and other places after the session today. So look, without, without further ado, why don't we kick it off? So, so first of all, you know, Andrew and Jeremy, can you, can you tell us you know, a bit about focal bracket therapy and, and, and what it actually is. And, and maybe Jeremy, can you kick us off? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and thanks PCFA and ICON for, for putting this on today. Uh, we really appreciate your involvement uh, and your ability to hopefully spread the message to anyone who's interested. So in terms of trying to explain focal brachytherapy, I thought what I might do to start off with is just show you a couple of really simple slides so that, you, so that people who are listening can actually picture what we're talking about. I think sometimes it's a bit hard to understand when uh, you, you're just talking. So I'll just share my screen really um, briefly here. Just bear with me while I get this up. All right, so um, hopefully you can see uh, my screen here and just going back to the first slide. So in terms of what it is, Focal brachytherapy is really quite simple. It's brachytherapy, which is the implantation of radioactive seeds into the prostate. But instead of putting them all through the prostate, we simply put them into the tumour and a very narrow margin surrounding the tumour uh, as a safety margin. And that really is essentially what it is. Now, for the, from the patient's perspective, if any listeners out there, for example, have uh, experienced, for example, a transperineal biopsy or, or know what it involves. Um, you can see a picture. I hope you can see this here on the screen. In fact, I might just try and make that full screen. Here we are. So if you can see my cursor on the right there uh, going over this picture, you can see a probe. This is entering the rectum. And there are these tiny little needles uh, implanting these uh, like grains of rice type seeds into the prostate. But as you can see over on the left here, they're only putting it into the tumour, not the entire area of the prostate. Now, if you've had a biopsy, you know that this is almost identical. So what we're doing with bra focal brachytherapy is almost like a, a transperineal biopsy in reverse. Instead of taking tiny samples of tissue out, we're implanting tiny seeds in uh, to the prostate. So it's it really is a, a minor procedure. I think, as I said, Jeff, the, probably the best way is just to quickly take you through what a, what a classic example case looks like. And, and we'll come back to who is the right person for this, but hopefully this will provide sort of an example. But in terms of who the right person is to get this treatment, that's really critical. And, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about that in a moment. But let's say, for example, this real patient, 65 years old, elevated PSA of 8.5. Okay, so normal PSA range is up to three. And this 
is the MRI that we obtained uh, for this patient. So you can see, I hope if I can just get my cursor going, there's kind of a, this whole area here is the prostate in cross section. And this is a, there's a darker area at the front, which corresponds to this darker area here, which corresponds to this lighter area here. This is all the same patient's MRI, just viewed in different ways. When you put this together, it's highly suspicious of prostate cancer. So based on that, we went ahead and did a biopsy. And this is really just a, a 3D representation of what our transperineal biopsy looks like. The green represents the prostate gland. The lines going through it, all these kind of pink lines are where the biopsy needles have taken samples from. And then you can see this pink lump at the front of the prostate, which matches perfectly with the MRI we saw before. This is the lesion that's been mapped out in 3D. And you can see a whole bunch of pink lines going through it there, which represent samples from that lesion. So we, we always sample the, the tumor itself as well as the rest of the prostate to make sure there's nothing going on. Now we ended up doing that with this patient, that's his diagram. And this is the result. So we did find what we call significant prostate cancer. In this case, grade group two in the new grading system or Gleason three plus four equals seven in the older grading system. Now this is intermediate prostate cancer. And importantly, it was only found in this area. All these other samples were clear. There was nothing there. Now, we then went on and performed focal brachytherapy. And of course, we'll talk more about the, the details of that. Uh, Andrew can go through in just a moment. But we mentioned that this man's focal, uh, sorry, his um, PSA before focal brachytherapy was 8.5. And we, as part of this registry that we're going to discuss, we are very, um, we, we monitor patients extremely closely after the treatment to make sure that everything's going as expected. So you can see these PSA levels that he's had post-treatment at six months, 12 months, 18 months. So notice that they're much lower than the pre-treatment PSA, but they don't go to zero. And that's expected because there's still normal prostate tissue remaining producing a degree of PSA. Um, furthermore, the patient had an MRI, which we'll see in a minute, um, and a post-treatment biopsy, uh, which showed low-grade disease only and treatment effect. There was no remaining significant cancer in the biopsy. And we do exactly the same biopsy. We take a whole lot of target cores from the tumor and a whole lot of uh, random samples from the rest of the prostate. The main thing I guess I want to get home to people listening about this particular example case is it really demonstrates exactly what we're trying to achieve with this new targeted treatment. I asked this guy, what side effects have you experienced from the treatment? And he said, what treatment? In other words, his, the impact on this man from either treatment or post, or post procedure or post therapy was so minimal that he made a joke of how little it had actually affected him. And then, and this was that post treatment MRI I was talking about. And you can see the yellow circle here with all these black dots in the middle. Each one of those black dots represents a brachytherapy seed. So you can see we've got this beautiful targeted treatment of this area with no remaining significant cancer. And I've put these yellow circles around these areas here because that's where the erectile nerves run Okay, as opposed to where the tumor is right at the front here. And so you, what you can see, I guess, demonstrated here is that the treatment has had no impact at all on his erectile function because the radiation is only being given to the tumor, not to the whole prostate. So I might just stop sharing my screen there for a moment so that perhaps we can discuss that further and, and perhaps Andrew might like to, to chime in on, on some of the technical aspects of that. Certainly. Um, thanks, um, uh, Jeremy and Jeff. Uh, you make a, a very convincing radiation oncologist, uh, Jeremy. Um, in terms of um, where I see focal brachytherapy, for us, it's essentially been uh, somewhat of an evolutionary process. And we've been doing whole gland brachytherapy for you know, over two decades. And um, in, our, in our group, per se, you know, we've been responsible for over two and a half thousand uh, implants. But this sort of takes things uh, to the, the next level. And as Jeremy has mentioned, um, essentially what it is, it's a personalised treatment plan, which is a portion to the risk of the patient in that individual. 
So each uh, patient that we treat um, is managed in a, in a very uh, unique way, taking into account the specific characteristics um, of that particular cancer. So in other words, it's not a, a one size fits all. So as, as Jerry mentioned, the, 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 the technical aspects of focal brachytherapy is us assuming you know, all the diagnostic information that our urological colleagues have provided with the multi-parametric MRI and all the eloquent biopsies. And then we make this um, a very complex three-dimensional um, model of the prostate, specifically then applying the seeds within the cancer. And we've slightly modified our deployment technique and we've been working uh, with the uh, trade to, to slightly re-engineer the prosthetic. But what we can do is we can very tightly confine the radiation um, to the uh, cancer itself with a, a small safety margin. And thereby, the beauty of this is, you know, it's, it's going to be no better at curing cancer, but the beauty will be um, that the doses to the surrounding healthy organs are, are going to be significantly less than what we see with whole gland brachytherapy. So you know, our anticipation will be that we see improved you know, qu um, quality of life outcomes across both bowel, urethral and sexual domains. Um, so um, you know, it's sort of like not all uh, cancers need to be uh, treated with a bazooka. If you've got a very bad prostate cancer and Jeremy will talk about what that looks like in a moment. Yes, you do need to go a more traditional route but this is a very nice intermediate option for men with low, low intermediate risk cancer where you don't know whether perhaps you might want to provide them with active surveillance or they've just got some features that might warrant definitive treatment. And this is that sort of mid ground option and uh, something that's new and I think very exciting. If I might, um, Andrew and Jeremy, just a, a quick question at this point, because this is a, a something which has been put to us and will be of interest to those listening. Uh, in, in terms of the potential side effect profile, you know, and side effects are an issue for some men who get treated uh, with prostate cancer. What can you expect? Because from the early discussion, it seems that side effects will be will be less uh, and different. So is that the case? So, Jeff, if, perhaps if I can start the answer and let Andrew finish. Um, uh, in the in the lead into this regis registry, uh, which Icon is running um, to gather all this prospective information, um, we have really piloted uh, this new therapy, uh, and so we've got an experience of over thirty patients now um, who have undergone this, and uh, our results to date would indicate that um, some patients do indeed uh, experience some side effects, but uh, in fact. The, the majority of them, uh, the side effects are really very mild. And uh, again, I'll, I'll defer to Andrew, but when you compare it to, for example, whole gland brachytherapy, which is an option, and certainly to radical prostatectomy, which I routinely perform also, uh, it's chalk and cheese. They're, they're, the side effects appear to be way lower. Obviously, I was giving a, 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 an example before, which was particularly demonstrable of what we're trying to aim for, but that was a real patient. Um, but Andrew, yeah, I'd be interested to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, well, so far the, you know, the international experience, which is consistent with our pilot data, um, suggests that your men do get a sense or degree of acute, you know, urinary symptoms, which on the whole is, is, is certainly very mild, self-limiting and mostly fully resolved within um, two or, or three months. Mm. Uh, whereas with the other option, that's sort of the whole gland uh, approach, oftentimes men do have quite significant uh, urinary irritability symptoms for even up to 12 months um, or longer. So just looking at that um, domain, um, you know, it, it, it certainly has been proven across a number of centres that um, it wins out. The case that uh, Jeremy um, showed before with uh, the anterior lesion, I think you could quite uh, nicely see that there was in fact zero dose to both um, rectum and also to the neurovascular bundle. So we would expect in that particular um, individual that there'd be no uh, impacts with bowel function and hopefully uh, maintenance of um, erectile function and sexual health. Because uh, commonly with whole gland brachytherapy, we would always 
um, consent mean that there could be a one to two percent chance that radiotherapy you know, could cause some damage to the front wall of the rectum. Mm -hmm. uh, and also depending on what their general health was like uh, and also their sexual function prior to treatment, there's, there will be an impact with erectile dysfunction, not immediately, but over the sort of 12 to 18 months after um, treatment. So I think uh, the early pilot data looks very promising, at least in terms of the um, uh, toxicity profile with this approach. And Jeff, that's really given us the impetus to go down this track and, and you know, put all the effort in to create this registry um, so that we can collect every little piece of relevant data um, going forward. Because I think that's one of the really critical comments I wanna to make today is that this all sounds very well and good um, and our experience to date is, but there's no point voicing that opinion or anecdotal sort of evidence without being able to back it up with hard prospective evidence. And that's, and that's why we're, we're running this registry. Mm, hear, hear. I mean, terrific. It's good to hear this. Can I just, just drop in with another question now in a sense? So um, is, is focal brachytherapy for everyone? Like where, where is it indicated and, and for which men might it not be appropriate? So, so maybe um, if that, that's probably a good opportunity, just for, perhaps if I can just share my screen briefly with you again. Please. Um, yeah. This is really, um, I'll just get that off there. So, oh, here so you go. tell me if you can see that. This is the inclusion criteria. And I, it's worth spelling this out because this is a critical point um, here uh, in, um, uh, for, for focal brachytherapy. So I'm just trying to move it up so it's a bit easier to see. That's better. Okay. Um, so as Andrew mentioned, the thing about focal therapy in general and focal brachytherapy is, is obviously one type of focal therapy is that it sits in the middle of two quite severe extremes. You've got, as Andrew mentioned, active surveillance on the one hand, where you're actually not treating at all. You're just observing closely and you may need treatment down the track. And then at the other extent, you've got some whole gland treatment, whether that's surgical uh, removal, radical prostatectomy, or whole gland brachytherapy, for example, or maybe external beam radiotherapy. So focal sits right in the middle of that, and therefore the eligibility criteria need to sit right in the middle of that. And as a result, um, these are what need to uh, be present. So PSA, in other words, can't be too high. Focal therapy of any sort should not be offered to patients with really aggressive disease. Um, and that relates also to the clinical stage. So you can see T1C or T2A. What that means is that either you can't feel it when you do a rectal examination, or you might be able to just feel it in one small area. Again, denoting, you know, this is, we're not talking about bulky um, aggressive disease. Um, you must be able to see the lesion on imaging. Now, mainly that's going to be um, under an MRI because that is the current standard of care uh, is to get an MRI before any biopsy, in fact, nowadays. Um, some uh, listeners may be interested to note that this is a guideline that only came in in March last year. A lot of us have been using MRI for a few years in Australia now, but it is now officially part of clinical guidelines based on uh, very high level evidence. So and this makes perfect sense. This is, if you're going to treat focally, you've got to know with great uh, confidence where the tumor is within the prostate. So PIRAD scoring is just a way of uh, how we score uh, MRI and three to five just essentially means that it's positive. In other words, you can see a suspicious lesion. The biopsy has then got to match what the Im imaging shows. If there's discordance between the two, it's not a goer because there's too much uncertainty as to, as to what we're actually dealing with. And then in terms of the actual grade, so I'm just sticking with the Gleason system because probably most people are still familiar with that. It's really, another really important point is we do not want to be using focal therapy to replace active surveillance in men who do not need treatment at all, okay? So we, there there's, uh, has been in the past a real criticism of over-treatment, which has been entirely justified when it, when it has occurred. And we don't want to be replicating that just because we've got some other treatment that we want to use. We want to use it in exactly the appropriate patient. 
So if you've only got Gleason 6, which is the lowest grade you can get on a biopsy, then you'd better have a fair chunky volume of it. So in this case, we're talking about more than a centimeter in diameter to make it worthwhile to consider this as an option. But really the, the main target group here is Gleason 7, and it can either be three plus four or four plus three, as long as it's not too big. So if it's four plus three, it's gotta be less than a centimeter. Again, like I was saying earlier, we do not wanna be treating really aggressive cancers, and we certainly do not wanna be treating multifocal disease. This is for a single lesion yep. within the prostate. Um, and it, it, look, it really is analogous. We can come back to this uh, down the track, but the idea is that you're just treating the tumor, not the whole prostate. And that's why you have so, so fewer side effects. Very, much, very similar to the whole concept of lumpectomy for localized breast cancer, rather than, you know, um, deforming the body by doing a radical mastectomy as used to be standard, um, women are now receiving a standard of care, a lumpectomy in certain circumstances where the tumor is small enough. It's exactly the same principle. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but prostate cancer is a multifocal disease. Well, a lot of the time it is. And when that happens, focal therapy is not appropriate. However, what we're finding with imaging these days is that a lot of the time, actually, it's unifocal disease especially if it's just significant cancer in one spot. And that's where focal therapy comes in. So follow-up, um, as I said, is very strict. Uh, we keep a very close eye on all our patients in terms of PSA, clinical exam, uh, a full quality of life assessment by way of a, a questionnaire. Uh, and then, and this is a really important point, at 18 months after the treatment, everyone has to have an MRI and a follow-up biopsy. The reason for this, even if the PSA has come down nicely, as we saw in that last patient, is that we really, because this is a new treatment, we need to substantiate with hard evidence that we've done the right thing. And the patient really has had their significant cancer eradicated. Andrew, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks, Jeremy. So, so certainly that's a very good synopsis of the sort of biologic factors, I suppose, of the target population that we're looking to um, treat and recruit. There are a couple of um, very sort of specific uh, inclusion or exclusion criterion that are you know, sort of very much, you know, radiation specific and not necessarily urologic or oncologic in nature. Um, and I'm just sort of looking at some of the um, online questions, which um, is alluding to some of these very factors. And there's a question, um, I think, from um, uh, Simon uh, Anderton, for example, who's asked, um, does size of the prostate um, matter uh, or make one um, uh, or could exclude someone from the treatment? The answer is potentially so. So the thing with whole gland brachytherapy is we are quite careful with who we accept on the program. And if you have a very large prostate, you know, something that could be in excess of um, 50 gram, 50 cc, up to 60 cc, then generally it's one very or more technically challenging to implant. You have to use a little bit more radiation. And I think men will generally have um, more inflammatory and urinary irritability symptoms after surgery. Whereas uh, with focal therapy, our, our sense is that um, these specific parameters perhaps can be um, relaxed a little bit, although we are still being extremely careful and applying due diligence, the sort of anecdotal and uh, evidence thus far suggests that even if you do have a slightly enlarged prostate, um, if you're just treating focally uh, a small volume of the gland, in fact, you actually probably can get through a treatment quite well with no extra morbidity. Another uh, thing that we also get um, quite concerned or a little bit curious about is if you've had a previous um, or prior TURP. And this may of course have been even some decades before the diagnosis of prostate cancer and overseen specifically because um, a man may have had obstructive symptoms from benign prostatic enlargement, not cancer. Well then this is another group where it, it can be um, tricky to implant only because usually when you've had a, um, you know, a large TURP, quite a lot of the central core of the prostate has been removed and actually quite difficult to engraft 
the seeds into the cancer and only unless we're absolutely confident that we can do so, we'll, we'll accept someone onto uh, the program. So just in terms of the logistics of the treatment, four weeks before uh, men have surgery, I'll do um, a transrectal ultrasound study under um, a, a very quick light sedation or general anaesthetic. And, and it's at that stage that I recreate um, a three-dimensional model of the prostate, looking specifically for all these geometric factors. And then I overlay all the diagnostic information from the biopsy and so forth. So we sort of you know, re recreate the, um, the crime scene uh, as such. Um, so look, there are two additional factors, uh, Jeremy. Hey, uh, Andrew, wh while you're talking there, th thank, thank you for that. Just to follow up, because you mentioned about a part of the process, how you know, you'll, you'll do some workup stuff a month before and you'll, you'll you know, visit the crime scene, as you've said. What, tell us just a, a quick change. Who's involved, who, who's involved in delivering focal bracket therapy, but both, you know, before, during and, and after the treatment? And what, what, can, what can fellows expect? So brachytherapy is, is very much a, a team sport. Um, and within our implant team, we've got a number of um, health um, professionals who have their own particular role and responsibility throughout the implant um, process, which sometimes can require two or three encounters over two or three months. Um, I, I work uh, with a, a craft group called um, Radiation Therapists, um, and these are uh, trained scientists, if you like, who by and large oversee uh, the delivery of um, uh, all aspects of radiation treatment delivery. The, the therapists that I work with have been and have undergone additional uh, training with um, interventional work. Um, these uh, 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 people assist me in, in designing the, 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 the treatment plan. So when you know, working out exactly how we should apply seeds uh, within the prostate and how many seeds we may need to order. Uh, they're also involved with doing uh, QA. Uh, so men who undergo um, this treatment will have a, another CT scan done usually on day three, just to make sure that all the, all the seeds um, are residing within the precise location. Overarching um, the, the crew, we've got medical um, physicists or radiation oncologists or oncology medical physicists. They, these are a crafty group of very intelligent individuals who by and large live in the uh, the dungeons uh, of our radiation oncology department, but I drag them up to theatre once uh, every two or three weeks, give them a little bit of vitamin D uh, and then banish them back down into the dungeon. And of course, we've got our um, prostate um, cancer uh, nursing team and our clinical nursing team within radiation oncology and theatre. Um, but actually overseeing the implant, it's always uh, a, a, a urologist with a radiation oncologist. So it's a joint, a joint implant process. Excellent. Thanks, man. It's, uh, um, you're, you're dungeons and uh, scenes of crime a repetitive theme Andrew which is interesting for radiation oncology actually Andrew you just mentioned about the prostate cancer specialist nurses we've got Sally Sarah with us who's the director of nursing for PCFA who oversees you know prostate cancer specialist nurses around the country uh, Sally have you got any observations about focal bracket therapy and and you know what role for the nurse and and interaction with patients because this is a relatively new treatment, emerging treatment, I suspect that our prostate cancer specialist nurses around Australia will start to get quite a few questions um, to them. And, and often when, when a man's diagnosed with prostate cancer and he's considering treatment options, um, we spend quite a lot of time um, with men in that setting because making a decision can be really, really difficult. And whilst as clinicians, we think that those, those men with all the options available to them are, are you know, quite fortunate in a way, but for the chap himself to make a decision is often the most difficult decision he's ever had to make. Um, so, and our response will be similar to men who are making any treatment decision really is about taking the time to learn about what the options are. Um, and and we, we're often, people will say to us, oh, you know, this option wasn't offered to me. Why wasn't I told? Why wasn't I told about this? Mm -hmm. um, the flip side is often that people haven't asked what are all of the treatment options available? Um, but I think in this setting, it's really important for men who are considering this to, to take the time to ask questions, to learn about it, and, and not to be scared off by a, a title of a treatment that, I mean, brachytherapy, you know, it sounds so scientific where it's, um, to, to actually learn about it and ask, ask um, questions like, you know, where, where will it be done? How much will it cost? Will I have to wait? 
what will the follow-up be afterwards? How do the side effects compare to other treatments like surgery or standard brachytherapy, that sort of thing? So um, whilst I think that our the questions in relation to focal brachytherapy will, will come more regularly now that it's out and people are learning about it, our, our responses generally will be along the same line, take the time to make the right decision for you. Yeah, look, thanks, Sally. And, and Jeremy, if I could throw to you, because Sally's just made the point in there about, you know, why is it so new, in a sense? I mean, how, how long has it been around and and, yep. and where is it available now? Because I think a lot of people are assuming, you know, why are we just hearing about this now? Yeah, and it's a, it's a terrific question. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, so I guess the answer is that um, actually focal therapy more generally has been around for some time, but but um, it predated uh, Im the proper imaging of the prostate. So it's only uh, really come to the fore now that we've got real confidence and evidence supporting the imaging <clears throat> as a regular part of prostate cancer workup. You got to remember, Jeff that, and, and Sally, that you know it was only a few years ago and still is practiced uh, in some places widely that no imaging was able to to actually visualize where the cancer is and so a guy would come in with an elevated psa he'd go off and have a biopsy straight away and it was so hit and miss finally with mri when it's read by experts you can get beautiful images like the ones i showed you before showing exactly where the cancer is and therefore focal therapy has had an absolute burgeoning around the world so um we don't, it's not yet in clinical guidelines. Um, and the reason is because it is so new in terms of the evidence body that's been currently being built. And obviously we're hoping to contribute to that ourselves. Um, so it's such an imaging reliant therapy. Uh, that is the reason why it's only becoming available now, yeah. essentially. Well one of the one of the questions, and Andrew mentioned that we are we are getting some questions piling up. One of the questions yeah. that's in there is is about, you know, do you use things like ADT uh, or, or other, you know, what you might call adjuvant type therapies uh, subsequent to um, to focal brachytherapy? Are there are there follow up treatments, or how how would that normally how would that normally be assessed and delivered, if necessary? I can I can mm -hmm. take that um, yeah. if you like. Um, Please, Andrew. The no the the, the um, utilisation of androgen deprivation therapy in this group um, is, is very uncommon. In fact, none of the men that we've um, uh, treated have uh, required um, androgen deprivation therapy. I mean, there are two reasons why you would use um, ADT for men having radiotherapy. Uh, one is if, you, if, if a man presents with intermediate or, or, or high-risk disease, so aggressive uh, biology or significant elevations in the PSA, uh, there is good data to support that the usage of anywhere between six months, even up to 18 months of, of androgen deprivation therapy with radiotherapy improves outcomes at 5, 10, 15 years. And, and that's certainly part of our uh, treatment uh, guidelines. Whereas the, the, the group uh, of men that we um, uh, are treating with focal um, have very much the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, low, low of intermediate risk. And these are the men, in fact, where it's not hard to sterilize the cancer. And as Jeremy said, in, in many instances, the question is, you know, should we be doing anything at all? Um, or are these are men who are right on the, on the boundary of being considered appropriate for radical treatment. So we, we don't need the ADT in this circumstance. The radiation basically will do um, a fine job on its own with in excess of 90, 95% chances of, of curing the nodule. So specifically getting rid of that red dot that uh, Jeremy showed on the MRI. Yeah. The only second reason why you might use ADT, uh, one, um, I mean, just quite coincidentally, just over the last six, eight months during COVID as a way of temporizing um, the situation in men who've been very reluctant, say, to come in and have procedures done during these uncertain times, that's very much a one-off. Uh, or sometimes if someone has a very, very big prostate, and we're talking like an 80 or 90 cc prostate, where we would ordinarily think, no, this is probably not the right case to move forward. But if, um, if someone is, is, you know, 
very hell bent, if you like, on, on moving forward with brachytherapy, then we can actually use ADT uh, to, to, to what we call cyto reduce or shrink the prostate. And if you put someone on six months of hormone therapy, generally the prostate uh, shrinks by about half. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that's one potential instance where you might consider it. We want to avoid uh, ADT, though, at all costs. This is a cohort of men where, where we don't think they need it. And, you know, this whole purpose um, initiative is to improve quality of life. And I think uh, avoidance of ADTs is a very important um, call. Jeff, you got me? If, if I can just sort of circle back to to uh, to the question again, um, uh, you know, yes, there may be some occasional instances as Andrew's described, but really the the intention of focal brachytherapy is to, for the patient to not require any further treatment. Um, that the, in other words, that the focal brachytherapy by itself will be curative. Yep. That is our intention, and to rid the prostate of any significant cancer. Now, having said that, the other really important point, and, and one of the questions came through relates to this, is that we do not want to burn any bridges. Um, now, one of the things that has been cited as being a potential disadvantage, for example, of whole gland brachytherapy is that if it doesn't kill all the cancer, if it doesn't cure the disease and there's remaining significant cancer that may be a threat to that patient's health or life, then what do you do? Uh, the problem can be that uh, performing a salvage prostatectomy or surgery after that in that situation can potentially be fraught with a higher rate of side effects, right? But this is where we want to make a very substantial distinction um, where focal brachytherapy, especially, for example, uh, with, the, with the case I just used where the tumor is right at the other end uh, of the prostate, away from the other structures, away from nerves, away from rectum and so forth. But it doesn't have to be. That's the ideal position whereby if that treatment fails, then we can still do a salvage prostatectomy, but it's not a true salvage because the remainder of the gland is still what we would call virginal, if you like. It's untouched. Okay? It hasn't been scarred up or treated by the radiation. And, and in fact, of the pilot patients that we've done, one of the 30 has required a salvage surgery uh, because there was remaining significant cancer. And that salvage surgery I performed myself was exactly as per a upfront radical prostatectomy. There was no difference. His PSA is zero and his side effect profile is exactly the same as if he had have had the radical prostatectomy up front. And again, that's the sort of example that I wanna uh, portray as being a, an underlying principle of this whole treatment, whereby worst case scenario, what we've done hasn't actually cured the whole cancer. There's, there should be minimal, if any, downside to then going on and doing what you would otherwise do to salvage that disease. But we think, and our experience to date has shown that even the incidence of that is very small, one out of 30 so far, which is, you know, very, we would be very comfortable with those numbers, um, even if, even for upfront treatment. So that's, that's encouraging. And of course, you just touched on there, Jeremy, one of the questions that's coming through about you know, does focal brachytherapy inhibit in any way the, the future potential if, if there needs to be surgery? And clearly it doesn't. Jeremy, forgive me if I missed this on your earlier slide, um, but you did talk about inclusion. In terms of men with early stage disease, what, what, do you have a, you know, an idea of what percentage of prostate cancer that might be? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Andrew and I have discussed this and we think that it's probably in the order of about 15 to 20 percent you know i mean that's obviously it's a minority but it's a really significant minority yeah, yeah. yeah. andrew no i'd concur with that um i i think that's 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 probably you know certainly benchmarked with the um international uh, series as well um again if, if i just Going back to what Jeremy was talking about, the you know the suitability and feasibility for salvage surgery. So, with the um, 
rolling out of this this program, we've you know redesigned um, and reinitiated how we deploy seeds. So when we're planning these men, we're we're actually planning. I'm planning them. You know, thinking like a surgeon, which is not something that radiation oncologists traditionally necessarily have taken into account. So you know, I'm firstly uh, keeping the dose very, very confined to within the capsule of the prostate, keeping it well away from um, all the critical structures. Thinking again, you know, what if you know in in five years is this if this chap requires a salvage procedure because there's cancer on the opposite side of the prostate, then you know, I'm keeping well away from those surgical planes as best I can to ensure that the residual fibrosis or anything that might make subsequent surgery difficult will not be a problem. And that one case that Jeremy uh, uh, mentioned was a testament to, to that. So there's been a change in, in how we deploy and how we plan these men specifically uh, to address those concerns and ultimately, you know, hopefully over time we'll be able to um, collect the data. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, there's, you know, it's been a terrific discussion to date. I, there's, a, there's a whole range of questions, you know, coming through. Uh, one of these is about can, can this type of brachiotherapy be also used in, in metastases? But I think the point you made earlier, uh, well, both of you, Jeremy and Andrew, that this is more of a this is more of a treatment for in situ cancer. Is that is that the, is that the case? Correct. Yeah, there, there's really no role outside of in situ disease, uh, Jeff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then another question that we had: so, some 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 fellows uh, have noticed that there might be more than one type of focal brachytherapy. Are, are there different varieties of this? And if so, is are we talking about a specific one, or what do, what do men need to keep an eye out for? Okay, yeah, just you go, Andrew. Oh yeah, just specifically, um, I mean, Jeremy is probably going to talk about a whole host of different energy sources that, that are being employed in the focal space. Uh, but just within radiotherapy itself, uh, you know, there, there's a second form of brachytherapy called high dose rate brachytherapy. Mm. At the moment, there's not a great deal of, um, of activity in, in this, in this, uh, with this particular modality. Now, high dose rate brachytherapy is a procedure where we would um, insert um, plastic uh, needles, not seeds, um, into the prostate through the perineum. And then men would actually leave theatre with these needles, if you like, um, hanging out of the, of the perineum, and they'd be then connected up to a machine called an afterloader, which then um, runs the radioactive source inside each of these uh, catheters individually. Now, high-dose high rate brachytherapy you know, has been traditionally used for men with high-risk disease, uh, men in whom we've found it quite difficult and challenging, in fact, to cure with traditional external beam. And so we use high dose rate as a supplement uh, to boost the dose up in a safe manner. Uh, the second way high dose rate brachytherapy can be used is, is with, for salvage. Um, theoretically, um, it, it can be, but there's not a lot of activity. You need, need a, a very purpose-built theater. You need lead shields with us. You know, essentially, we don't need any shielding whatsoever. The seeds are of such low activity that men essentially can go home same day uh, with no restrictions placed. Uh, so probably from a convenience perspective, uh, low dose rate does have a slight edge over high dose rate. Mm. Jeff, and Jeff, yeah, if, perhaps if I can just round off, uh, Andrew's you know, really honed in on the, the radiation options uh, that, are, that are out there. But with regard to focal therapy more broadly, basically anything that can ablate or kill cancer cells uh, has potential utility in this space. And so there's a whole lot of investigation going on around the world at the moment, including in Australia, not just in focal brachytherapy, which I'll come back to in a moment, but you can freeze the tumour, you can burn the tumour, you can electrocute the tumour. There are various different ways of killing cancer cells. The reason we've gone down the path of focal brachytherapy is that we have the expertise. Uh, I mean, Andrew is one of the most experienced brachytherapists uh, in Australia and, and probably the world. And therefore we're maximizing uh, our, our leveraging off his expertise and experience. I think the other aspect of brachytherapy itself is that when used 
for the whole gland, we've got decades worth of data to support its use in that space. Whereas some of the other energy sources being used do not have that. Uh, they're new types of uh, energy. Uh, photodynamic, for example, and electroporation have been around for a much shorter period of time and therefore don't have mature data based on whole prostate gland treatment, which, which brachytherapy does. And finally, it's a pragmatic uh, approach. And that is that in Australia, brachytherapy um, has coverage from Medicare and, and the health insurance agencies. So you're not looking at some very hefty uh, out-of-pocket cost at all. Yeah. All right, look, just a, 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 a sort of a change of tack, just to revisit. So a fellow uh, has been indicated for focal brachytherapy. He studies work up, he, he turns up. So, so what happens? I mean, and then how is he when he goes home? Does he go home the same day? Does he go home in an hour or does he go home the next day? Is he sore? What, 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 tell us about that. Andrew? Sure. Um, thanks, Jeff. So um, it truly is a very minimally invasive treatment. And what I would often um, inquire if I'm seeing someone uh, for a consult is uh, really just to get a, get a picture as to how they were after their biopsy. Mm -hmm. And if anything, uh, the, the, the experience is probably no worse than, than a biopsy. I mean, we use very similar equipment to what we would use to acquire the biopsies, but we use fewer needles, the needles are smaller, and the biopsy gun needles are, can be sort of reasonably traumatic. Um, it's typically a same day procedure. The process itself would, would probably take around 15 to um, 20 minutes to put the seeds in. And then after the implants overseen, then um, uh, Jeremy would, would oversee a cystoscopy. Uh, so apart from two or three hours in recovery, they'd be home same day, um, perhaps just with some Panadol, a little bit of ice um, under the tail to alleviate any bruising with instructions perhaps to just take it easy for a couple of days, no heavy lifting for a week. Thereafter, pretty much normal activities um, as tolerated. Uh, so again, no worse than the biopsy. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to summarise it. That, that's, that's been uh, my experience as well. Uh, and and I, I guess that, that example case that I was painting uh, the picture of at the start kind of attests to that. Can we just check, so wh where is focal brachytherapy available now in Australia? I mean, has it been limited by COVID? Is it generally available? Will it become more available? Because um, I know you're both based in Melbourne, of course. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to, are you happy to feel that? Yeah, so... so Again, I mean, focal therapy per se is, is offered in a number of institutions, both mainly along the um, East Coast, but specifically for brachytherapy. Look, it, it is a fairly new and emerging um, area. I think, um, you know, we've done the right thing in that we've initiated a, a protocol uh, that's passed through ethics. We're collecting the data as per um, the consensus guidelines suggested uh, one should. When starting the program, COVID has um, held us back quite significantly given um, issues with theatre access and cancellation of um, non-essential surgery. So, uh, but th there has been some discussions with um, some of our radiation oncology colleagues, both in South Australia and uh, New South Wales, uh, not, not Queensland to this point, but we're looking at you know, when we um, start small, get confident and then deploy potentially at other sites to make it more accessible. There, there is there is a a a, a, a protocol that, that is um, uh, active at uh, uh, St George Hospital in New South Wales, with a, a partial volume uh, brachytherapy. Now, again, I know the investigators who are involved in this study. Um, they, they're doing a slightly different technique to us, so we are picking off the cancer. Uh, what this particular study is looking at is offering something called hemigland. So essentially treating half of the prostate, even if the cancer occupies less than one eighth of the cancer, they'll sort of split the prostate in the middle and treat the left or the right or the front or the back, which is, I think, again, a, a very interesting and parallel um, um, uh, protocol for us to, to, to marry up ours against. Uh, I think we, we, we felt that we wanted to uh, oversee what we call ultrafocal, so really being as, as, as minimalistic as possible. So just treat the lesion, which we think ultimately is possible in this day and age with the uh, unprecedented information we can now garnish from PETs and MRIs and biopsies. 
Uh, and also, again, as I said, I think that um, our approach will potentially um, have, have less impact on, on, uh, on long-term um, quality of life. The, can I, just one quick one, um, follow up in terms of access. Uh, is, is there any treatment available at the moment in, in public settings or is it primarily, in, um, is it primarily in, in private settings at this point in time? Again, at this stage, um, I think um, all, all of this, you know, focal brachytherapy is to be run on, on, a, on a protocol, given it is still considered a non-standard of care intervention. Um, and from my understanding, the public services around the country are, are offering whole gland, not, 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 not yeah. uh, focal. Not focal. So, yeah. so this is done. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting towards the oh, Sorry, Jeremy, please. Oh, no, just to, just to back up Andrew's comment that, you know, this is done through uh, ICON centres yeah. uh, in partnership with Epworth. And it's still getting, that's right. And as you know, you're still collecting data and still developing evidence for that and it's delivery, which is important. Can, can I, uh, we're getting towards the end, perhaps just maybe uh, Jeremy, then Andrew, if that's okay in that order. Oh. So if you're one of those men in, you know, the, that 20% that approximate of men in that, you know, early stage um, prostate cancer who, who could be considered for, for focal brachytherapy, it, could you just summarise for us, you know, what are the potential benefits for it and, you know, what might be the, the risks or side, fact, or, or side effects? Yeah, sure, sure. So I think, you know, if, if you do fit that eligibility criteria, it usually means that all options are on the table for localised management. Uh, like I said before, it could be active surveillance, uh, could be at the other extreme where you have your whole prostate removed. And the, the whole idea of this is to aim to get the best of both worlds where on the one hand we cure the cancer that's our intention we eradicate all of the uh, cancer cells that are a threat to that man's health and even life but at the same time we keep the side effects to an absolute minimum so that's that is what we're aiming for that is our small experience to date and that's why I think um, you know and I'm, I'm happy to say this I guess if it was me, and if I fit the criteria, knowing that I'm not burning any bridges, um, I think it's a really worthwhile option to consider. However, it is early days, and this is why we're collecting data. You will not find this in any clinical guidelines at this stage because we do not have the data uh, that we can demonstrate um, ne their, uh, its need to be in clinical guidelines, and that's what we're trying to build because we've got a very logical uh, thesis or hypothesis uh, that, that sits, that underpins this whole, this whole uh, uh, focal brachytherapy. Andrew? Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I do oftentimes um, draw the parallel as you have, um, Jeremy, with, with how we've um, you know, revolutionized the management of um, women with breast cancer. There are a lot of parallels between management of breast cancer and prostate cancer. And, you know, again, the, the, the way that we move from immediate mastectomy to, to less surgery and better functional outcomes is paralleled with what this process uh, and, and intervention is, is all um, about. But I'll always, again, come clean, certainly um, with whole gland brachytherapy. We've got two plus decades with over 150, 200,000 men who've been managed, but in the focal space, th th there is limited data. And I think um, the, 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 the uncertainties, I suppose, which I'll highlight are, look, if, if you did need to come back in four or five years' time and have a radical prostatectomy, you know, we, we don't know necessarily what that experience will look like. We're confident that the doses are very confined, the damage to surrounding tissue very minimal, but, but you know, we can't put our hands in our heart um, and, and say with, with uh, certainty that it will absolutely be fine. Um, but again, I think, you know, in the spirit of uh, progressing um, medical care, um, I think a lot of men are very attracted to, to this particular treatment. Uh, and fortunately um, have been very willing to contribute the data. And, you know, so the, filling out questionnaires madly for us uh, every uh, every sort of four or five months. And so again, thanks uh, to, to to our participants who, who are helping us um, grow the knowledge base. Excellent. Hey, look, th thank you very much. Can I, can I just, just one question before we go, it's come up through there. Just about, and you've, you've talked about the wonderful progress we've made in imaging and, and 
uh, people throw away on throwing around acronyms, you know, PSMA and PET and all that. But I mean, it, so what, what particular, we've had a, got a question about what particular imaging is used and is one better than the other? Maybe I could um, try and field that one. Um, so yeah, MRI is the, the, the sort of mainstay. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, that's because it is part of the standard clinical pathway. Um, now, having said that, what, what, we're, in, what we're finding as, as time passes and we get more and more experience using PSMA PET is that there's the odd patient whose cancer doesn't show up on an MRI, it's not visible. Um, and you may then order a PSMA PET scan, which is a totally different type of scan in that same patient. And because it's a different type of scan, it may well be visible. Now, if it is visible and if a subsequent biopsy matches in terms of area and size and so forth, then they are eligible. As long as we have a reliable imaging modality that can track the before and after of this treatment, then, uh, then the person is eligible. I noticed one of the questions that also alludes to that same thing, Jeff, is, was, you know, what if there's nothing visible on an MRI? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes a patient will still go ahead and have a biopsy and, and if there's significant cancer, well, if, we, if the patient then gets a PET scan and it's not visible on that either, then that patient really shouldn't be on our Liberate registry because um, it really doesn't fit the criteria. And there's just a little bit too much uncertainty about where uh, the cancer truly is because we haven't been able to visualise it. Uh, we've just managed to strike it with one of the biopsy needles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, look, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I, we're getting uh, close to the end. In fact, we, we do need to wrap up. I, I would like to thank on behalf, well, of both ICON and PCFA, of course, um, uh, Andrew, Jeremy and Sally for their time this afternoon. It's important we, we do take time out to hear about new and exciting avenues of treatment um, and research and uh, an endeavor in trying to control this disease and it's nice to see this happening um, it was a terrific session and uh, it, it does i think give us great confidence uh, looking forward in terms of how our researchers and clinicians are developing new and exciting ways to to control prostate cancer so look thank you very much for that if if for, for anyone out there who'd like to re we look at this or tell someone about it. I can assure you a recording of this will be on the uh, ICON website. I know Jeremy's got his, his own website, which I expect will carry a copy of this as well. And of course, you can always go to uh, pcfa.org um, and check that out on our website or Prostate Cancer Foundation Australia YouTube uh, and, and online community where we will, we will carry uh, this as well uh, to make sure that we keep you all uh, very much uh, up to date with, with what's happening um, with focal brachytherapy. So again, to, to Sally, uh, to Andrew, uh, and to Jeremy, thank you very much on behalf of um, on behalf of PCFA and all those all those men and their family members out there who've been impacted by this disease. Thank you.